Hello, I'm Jenna Cantor, and welcome to Physiotherapy Performance Perspectives, a physical therapy podcast for performing artists. Today, I am interviewing Dr. Mike Connors, who is joining me from Texas. Dr. Connors, for those who have not heard, has a BS in biology from Stockton College in 2001, a master's in physical therapy from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of the New Jersey Rutgers University in 2003, a post-professional doctor of physical therapy degree from Temple University in 2008, and a doctorate degree at Texas Women's University in 2017. He became a board-certified specialist in orthopedic physical therapy from the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties in 2011. Dr. Connors is an outside consultant for Texas Ballet Theater, a professional ballet company in Fort Worth. He is also an adjunct professor in orthopedic physical therapy for the entry-level doctor of physical therapy program at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. In addition, Dr. Connors is the current president of the Texas Physical Therapy Association, advocating regularly for the physical therapy profession in Austin and Washington, D.C. on regulatory health policy and payment policy issues impacting physical therapy and health care delivery. So Mike is joining us today to discuss preparing for the injuries at the end of the ballet season. So this is interesting. Instead of the beginning, it's the end. So why specifically did you choose this topic? So I feel like it's the one area where we never, and I say we, like as a healthcare team, we don't put a lot of emphasis on. Um, like I can give you my own personal experience in the last three years, the end of the season hits. It's like the end of Nutcracker. Uh, dancers disperse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're, yes. They're done, um, especially after our grueling 38-week schedule, you know, from August to May, you know, a dancer's ready to, to take a break. It's like a teacher on the last day of school. Yeah. Um, so we never have taken the opportunity to talk to them about it. And then we get back, you know, that's in, in May. They come back first week of August or last week of July and they get into a very grueling schedule. It's not like, um, you know, PT school or, or other, you know, types of um, life events where you can gradually work into something, you get used to the routine. It's like, you know, zero to a hundred in five minutes. And so really gave me more of an interest in focusing on how do we give education to dancers to stay healthy and stay conditioned in those two months off so that when they do come back, we're decreasing the likelihood of early injury development. Yeah, that makes sense. So how are injuries different at the end of the ballet season in comparison to if they got injured at the beginning of the ballet season? So I don't think the injuries actually change. I think the only thing that you add is an element of fatigue. Um, because you just have, you know, the largely professional dancers on, again, speak for ballet. Um, their routine is about 30 hours a week of actual performing, you know, so they're, they're using their bodies at a very high level, um, for six hours a day, five days a week. Um, so that eventually is going to take its toll and they have layoffs in between the schedules that at least will allow for some rest and recovery, but we all know what that is. That's not that's a way for a dancer to completely shut down just like a student who had a really hard semester and you're like, I'm out. Um, I'm going to take this, <laughs> this week to just hit the reset, control off the lead and get ready to get back on a week from Monday and, and do what I need to do to handle it. So I think it's, it's just that fatigue factor that, that further enhances any potential for injury. So what do you believe causes this difference in fatigue? Because couldn't they just even as so much be fatigued even when coming back and starting their season, they could maybe be well rested or maybe not because they've been out having a lot of fun, you know, and staying up late and not getting enough sleep and taking advantage of not having to be prepared. So what, what, what do you think causes the difference in that whole fatigue factor? No, I think it's a great question. I think the dancers largely understand. I mean, if you're getting paid to uh, take care of your body, um, just whether you're an Olympian or you're a ballet dancer, you do it because A, you like to get paid, and B, <laughs> you like to, um, you love what you do. I mean, the, the term starving artist is every bit of true, and you know this. Um, you don't get into to dance in any form or fashion to say, I'm going to make millions doing this. Oh, yeah. You do it because you have a true love for the art form. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I think it's just the natural body. I, I don't think it's that they abuse themselves. I, I don't think they stay up late. They, you know, go out and party every other night. I think it's just like anything else. Um, and even more so the, the physical fatigue, I think just as much as we spoke about earlier, it's the, the emotional and the mental fatigue. Um, when you think about a patient in chronic pain, right? Like that just becomes a, a debilitating at times um, existence because you just, you hurt all the time. And I think we don't think about them as, as necessarily chronic pain because it might not rise to a level what we would define. But when you hurt all day long, there's an emotional and, and psychological toll that's taken whether or not you recognize it, you know, cognitively yourself. Um, so I think that we just have to look at it more globally to say, like, if, if I'm performing at a high level and I'm hurting for six hours a day, five days a week, in some way, that's going to take a toll on my body. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. If a dancer's jumping in, so they, they have this, these two months break, and then they go back into classes, they go back into rehearsals, and then things get really crazy, as we were saying in uh, two podcasts ago about the Nutcracker, where they start having all these shows, this grueling performance schedule for the Nutcracker. During that time, do you think a dancer maybe needs more time for recovery? Or do you think maybe even at the end of their whole season in May, do you think they may actually need more time for recovery before being able to even jump back into staying in shape? I do. I mean, I think there is a window of period that is specific to an individual. And, you know, a dancer knows themselves better than anybody else. I can't tell them what their rest recovery should be. They've been doing this for X number of years. And you know what your body needs to recover. Um, if it were my recommendation, just even for pure psychological, you know, break from the routine, I would say if your last day is like, say, May 31st, I wouldn't even think about doing anything related to physical activity till like June 15th, um, because everybody needs a break. Your body needs to heal. You need to catch up on your sleep. You need to catch up on life. Um, and then start to figure out how, like I know some dancers will continue to take class during that whole break and they'll do like one hour a week. Um, some switch, um, a lot of the male dancers I work with and some female dancers, um, take up cycling mm -hmm. because it's a relatively controlled, low impact activity. Um, so they do a bunch of fun rides during the summer, um, which in Texas is kind of hellish, but okay. Um, <laughs> it doesn't, it's going to be very relaxing to me when your, your job is fitness, but, um, you know, I think whatever that is for that individual, then, you know, you just have to put the time in, um, and, and be okay. You know, if you. For example, I know, you know, a lot of dancers that struggle with that. Um, you know, what, what do I use to measure fitness? Do I use my BMI? Do I use body fat percentages? Do I use weight? It's like, you know, take that mentality completely off the table for two weeks and just be you. Enjoy like back when you didn't have as much responsibility. Um, visit family. Uh, go on a vacation. Just decompress and and. You know, like I say, I'm plugged from the Matrix. I'm probably dating myself there. <laughs> that reference, but <laughs> hopefully somebody will know. Um, but just, you know, whatever they need to do to get back to baseline, because I, I do think, like I said earlier, that that emotional and psychological and physical toll um, does become um, not exponential during the season, but you do anything for 38 weeks. And, and that's a long period of time. And when you add in all of the other elements that, that they deal with on a regular basis, I think it, it puts them in a frame of mind where they just need to, to decompress a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So for the next question, I'd actually like to get more specific because we tapped upon it before in an interview prior about how their glute strength in general could be strengthened. So do you think, that focusing on specific muscle groups where dancers tend to be generally weak could be a good way to help reduce risk of injury when returning back to their sport? I do. Um, in fact, to that point, this season is the first season we're going to demo. Um, so our physical therapy team is going to do more or less like a end of the season debrief. I don't know what else you want to call it. Not an exam, but um, really just you know, spend some time with each individual dancer in the company and evaluating their for lack of a better term, strengths and areas for improvement. Um, so, you know, check a, a box, almost like an FMS, functional movement screen, where we look at someone and say, you know, you're really solid in these areas, but it would be great if you could focus on these specific muscle groups. So your, your quadriceps muscles, your hamstrings, your glutes, 
Um, and here are a couple ideas. Um, and then if they have other you know, questions that arise, try to address those then instead of, hey, just uh, stay fit during the off season and uh, be prepared to come back in, in you know, August. Yeah, it's guesswork then. Yeah. Exactly. Are there any exercises you recommend a dancer perform at this time? I do. Uh, planks are probably my go-to, um, and even though they're not a direct carryover in a function sense from um, being upright and, and for what they do, but um, it's a great way to challenge the core. It's a great way to incorporate Pilates principles of like um, slow controlled movement, um, and that is a direct correlate carryover to ballet. I mean, ballerinas move very quickly at times, but part of the art form is slow controlled movements, you know, the, the way those lines finish out um, in some of those, um, you know, different dance positions and dance moves. Um, so I think looking at ways that you can challenge planks that will challenge the dancer appropriately that will target those problem areas of like the glute need or the hamstring for hip extension. Um, and then what does their core look like? Uh, back to my earlier assumption, we talked about one or two podcasts ago, um, that dancers were, were fit and strong. And, and that's true for a large part of the population. Um, but what I also realized is just because muscles look strong, you know, a dancer has a six pack, doesn't mean necessarily that from a neuromuscular control perspective, that they have the, the motor control to maintain excessive hypermobility and sustained positions and it, extreme movements. Um, with simultaneously decreasing their risk for injury. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. This is a very, very helpful information session. And thank you again to our listeners for joining us for another episode of Physiotherapy Performance Perspectives. Join me on the first Monday of every month for the next episode. To hear more episodes, click on the link in the description below to view the website. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash PT Performance Perspectives to stay informed. And finally, if you want to get in touch, email me at ptperformanceperspectives at gmail.com. Thank you so much, Mike. Take care. Bye, everybody.